This morning I'm excited to launch our new sermon series uh, with you, Psalms of Hope. Psalms of Hope, if you've clicked on the news at any point in the last five or so months now, you might think that the world is coming to an end and that all the uh, pre-tribulationists were obviously wrong because we're living through the worst of it as we speak. Now more than ever, we need hope. And for that, we need to turn to God's Word. And this morning, we begin in a rather unexpected place in the Psalms. Of all the obvious Psalms of hope that we will get to in this series, God willing, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 91, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways and many other beautiful psalms. At first glance, Psalm 13 for this morning does not seem to fit. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Few people would characterize that as a psalm of hope. In fact, Psalm 13 has traditionally been categorized as a psalm of lament. Over one-third of the psalms in Scripture are laments. What is a lament? Mark Rogop, whose recent book, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, Discovering the Grace of Lament, has been a huge help for understanding this idea of lament, defines lament this way. He says, lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. Lament provides a pathway for being honest and processing the emotional struggles of life. It affirms talking to God about struggles, disappointments, and hurts. It gives us a biblical language that is raw and candid. A language for the land between a hard life and trusting in God's sovereignty. A prayer language for God's people as they live in a world marred by sin. It is how we talk to God about our sorrows as we renew our hope in His sovereign care. To cry is human, but to lament is Christian. And I want to show you this morning that not only is lament distinctively Christian, but it is also definitively hopeful. There is great hope in our ability to lament as God's people. As Martin Luther said, sometimes Hope despairs, and yet despair hopes. I just want to acknowledge from the outset this morning that we have a lot of folks here, maybe many of you watching us, joining us from home, who will be hearing this message today from a place of deep despair. And if you are not in that place this morning, then praise God. And you can just store this message away in the back of your mind and your heart for later because if you are blessed to live long enough, you will get there again at some point in the future. You will suffer. But for many of us, it's this morning. David's words here, how long, O Lord, feel especially personal and raw today. Some of you are trying to figure out single parenting right now while you work and now homeschool your kids. Some of you have recently lost jobs. Some of you haven't felt human touch for five months now. Some of you suffer from PTSD, from bipolar disorder, from schizophrenia, anxiety, such severe depression that you struggle to even get out of bed most days. Some of you have battled infertility for years, had multiple miscarriages, you've had stillbirths. You've lost children to rare genetic diseases and suicide. You were diagnosed with cancer and told you only had a few years to live. You've been stuck in loveless marriages for decades now. You feel totally unknown and uncared for. Caught your spouse cheating on you. You've waited for them to recover from addiction for years now to no avail. You've had loved ones in and out of prison and rehab dozens of times. You were sexually abused as a child. You were spiritually abused as an adult. You've been racially profiled, discriminated against. You've been homeless. You've been shot. You've been abandoned by a parent. 
And you have watched your own dying parents reject Jesus all the way to their graves, knowing that they would spend an eternity separated from God in hell forever. And that's just the edited for time and content version here at West Hills. I had to cut other examples because they were too graphic and traumatic. And I'm sure that even as your pastor, I don't even know the half of it, the half of the suffering that is represented in this room and online right now. To be human is to suffer. There's a story of a young prince whose father wanted to insulate him from suffering. And so he confined him to a palace, to a life of luxury and pleasure. But the boy longed to see the world, and so one day in disguise he escaped. For the first time in his life he encountered sickness and aging and death. This sent the prince into an existential crisis, and he renounced his comfortable life for a life of asceticism. And after six years of searching, he finally discovered the secret to life, the cure for suffering, detachment. If you don't really care about material things, about your house, about your body, then you won't care when they burn down or break down and get old. If you don't get attached in relationships, then you won't have to suffer when those around you hurt or hurt you when they pass away. The answer to suffering is detach. That prince's name was Siddhartha Gautama. Most of you know him simply as the Buddha. His teachings on suffering form the backbone of Buddhism, the fifth largest religion in the world today. Buddhism's approach to dealing with suffering is essentially to deny it. Through meditation, it is possible to achieve a higher state of consciousness that is untouched by human suffering. We're all born into this broken, painful, material world that's stained by suffering, but the goal is to transcend it, nirvana. It's the ultimate form of denial. There's another approach one can take to suffering. Despair. Probably the fastest growing religion in this country is atheism, the belief that there is no God. We are the products of blind chance, and when we die, our bodies become food for worms, and ourselves simply cease to exist. Most of us will be forgotten forever. Atheist Bertrand Russell summarized his own worldview in this way. He said, man is but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. Nothing can preserve a life beyond the grave. All the brightness of human genius is destined to extinction and the vast death of the solar system, and the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. The firm foundation of unyielding despair. Who's excited? When asked if his version of reality made him depressed, atheist Richard Dawkins famously replied, the universe is bleak, cold, and empty. Get used to it. But friends, in the face of such suffering, in these duly sinister so-called solutions to it, denial and despair, I want to encourage you this morning from the truth of God's word that there is a third option. A response to suffering that rejects both the flippant minimizing of denial, everything is fine, Suffering is just an illusion and rejects the callous pessimism of despair. Everything is awful. Suffering is the only reality in this life, and that is to dare to hope. Everything is not fine at the moment, but I dare to trust that one day it will be again, that one day all of this hurt will be healed, that one day all of this brokenness will be fixed, that one day all of my suffering will be redeemed. And I choose to live today while I'm still suffering in light of that future hope that I know I can count on because my hope rests in a God who I know I can count on. That is my prayer for every one of us here today who is hurting, that God would use Psalm 13 this morning to move you past denial, past despair, to a place where you can dare to hope again in the steadfast love and in the bountiful goodness and in the ultimate salvation of our God. 
So, would you stand with me as you're able for the reading of God's Word? And I'd like to try something a little different this morning, since Psalm 13 is so short, to try and make this even more personal for us. I'd like to invite you to read it out loud together with me. You can follow along in your own Bibles. I have the words on the ESV translation on the screen in front. But can we just read Psalm 13 together aloud here? <clears throat> How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul? and have sorrow in my heart all the day. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed over him lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you that it is living and active and has the power to radically change and transform lives, to radically change and transform hearts, to radically change and transform suffering, to redeem it, to use it for good. God, only you can do that. So God, we cry out to you. We appeal to you, ask you this morning, and we trust you to do it again in someone's heart this morning. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Some scholars think that David wrote Psalm 13 while he was fleeing the jealous rage of King Saul who wanted to kill him to prevent David from ascending to his throne. Others think that David wrote this letter years later in life while fleeing his own jealous son Absalom's rage who wanted to kill him and steal David's throne. Either way, what you have here is David, the boy who defeated giants the king who united a nation, a man after God's own heart who is presently on the precipice of a pit of utter destruction. But, that beautiful word in verse 5, but, but, out of his hurt and his fear, what David offers us here in these six short verses is nothing short of a blueprint for Lament, the distinctively Christian response to suffering. There are three movements in a prayer of lament. Many of us are familiar with the ACTS model of prayer, A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. That is a wonderful biblical outline for prayer. But so too is the CAT prayer. That is the acronym for a prayer of lament. I'm not trying to diss felines necessarily, like cat owners need to lament, although I am more of a dog person, but cat just happened to be the best acronym here, and I trust that it'll be more memorable now. Next time you're despairing, you will think of cats, and you will remember how to lament. Step one is we cry out to God. We cry out to God. Now, with each of these steps, I also want to show you why we find hope in the process of lamenting. And to do that, I want to point us to two key attributes of God per step that ought to inspire great hope in us. And for step number one, crying out to God, we can find hope in that because it means God is real. 
God is real. He's there. He exists. Here's what I'm getting at. Where does the atheist turn when he despairs? Whom does the Buddhist beseech when she is hurting? As difficult as your circumstances and my circumstances in life may get Christian, and this is not intended to minimize or take away anything from your pain. Life can be incredibly hard sometimes. Nevertheless, we can hope in the knowledge that no matter how bad it gets, at least we've got a God to complain to. And it's biblical to do so. Read the book of Job. I look back on one of the darkest periods in my own life when my father left my family. And I remember at times I was so despondent. I was so enraged at God that I would literally look up at the sky and I would raise my middle fingers as high and as close to God's face as I could get them and I would scream obscenities. You blankety blank how could you God I hate you and years later when I came back to the faith I was able to appreciate a peculiar beauty in the fact that even in the midst of my hatred of God I never could quite bring myself to disbelieve in him I never could quite bring myself, convince myself that God wasn't real. And I firmly believe today that most people who think they are atheists aren't really atheists at all. They just don't like the God they believe in. They innately know, as all of us do, Romans chapter 1, God's existence is undeniable. Atheists just don't like Him. And now I think about David here in Psalm 13. I don't think that he, I don't think that the Holy Spirit who inspired these words of lament would necessarily advocate for us cussing God out and flipping him the bird. And yet, what I do think we find here is biblical precedent for real, honest, uncensored, vulnerable crying out to God. He's big enough to take it. He can handle it. David's words here are raw. Here is the Duval paraphrase translation of verses 1 and 2. God, have you forgotten all about me? Are you ignoring me? Have you abandoned me all on my own? Am I doomed to be depressed all day, every day, for the rest of my life? God, do you even care about my affliction? Are you ever going to make good on your promises? How long, O oh Lord? And God's clear answer to that question elsewhere in his word is not long. Not long. Without minimizing our suffering, our God assures us that relatively speaking, in the grand scheme of eternity, our suffering in this life will be but a blip on the radar screen. Romans 8, 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not even worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us you have it really rough in this first world country of ours, you may endure suffering for 10, 20, 30 of your 70 or 80 or 90 years on this earth. But let's just say for the sake of argument that you suffer all 90 plus years of your life. Now take that and stack it up and compare it against eternity. An eternal glory that is to be revealed to you if you persevere to the end. If you hold fast and firm in your faith. What's awaiting you? 
He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Behold, he says, I am making all things. What? New. All things new. You say, well, that sounds pretty great to me. God, what are you waiting for? How long, O Lord, must I wait for all of this to be made new, for my broken marriage to be made new, for my aging body to be made new, for my failing finances to be made new? Come, Lord Jesus, come. What are you waiting on? Return and make all of this mess new already. What are you waiting on? His answer? 2 Peter 3.9 The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God's patience to fulfill His promises is so that you won't perish. And he doesn't just wish that you should reach repentance. For those of you who have not yet reached repentance, if you have not yet received Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning, if you are playing Russian roulette every single day with your eternal future, yes, you need repentance first and foremost right now. Do not wait. But even for those of us who are saved, God wishes that we should reach not just repentance, but sanctification. If you are still suffering in this life, brother, sister, take heart. That means that God is not yet done purifying you. W.S. Plumer writes, reminds us, there must be a great deal of dross in even good men to make daily and long-continued sorrow so necessary to their sanctification. That's a great quote. Here's another one. That is good for us, which leads us to pray. It is better to be praying in the whale's belly than asleep in the ship. Do you believe that? Do you believe that in the midst of your suffering? Can you pray like, like the Apostle Paul? I rejoice in my sufferings. Nelson Walker uses this analogy. He says, a bar of steel is worth about $5. If you turn it into horseshoes, it's worth about $10. If you fashion it into needles for sewing, that's roughly $350. But if you fashion it into the delicate springs that go into fine watches, it's worth $2,500. The difference in worth is how many times it got cut run through the oven to be heat treated, smashed, twisted, formed, heated up again, smashed again, polished. There's no such thing as instant godliness. Jesus said, the one I love, I will prune. Pruning hurts. Some of you are thinking, wow, Jesus, you must really love me then. Maybe, maybe don't love me so much, God. But here's the second reason we can find hope in our cries, friends, because God is understanding. When you cry out to God in your suffering, you can take heart because you're in really good company. Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Jesus. The Bible says that our suffering identifies us with Christ, the suffering servant. It unites us with him, the one who for no good in us, but for the goodness that was in him, voluntarily stepped off of heaven's throne to come and identify with us, to unite himself to us in his suffering. We do not have a high priest, Hebrews 4.15, who is unable to sympathize with us in our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
And actually, Jesus was tempted in ways that you and I will never be tempted. I don't know about you, but Satan has never offered to give me all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. God has never allowed him to tempt me that way because God probably knows how I would respond. I've never been tempted as I suffered unimaginable physical agony, being flogged and nailed to a cross, and even worse, emotional and spiritual turmoil, being cut off from my perfect union with God my Father while I bore his wrath instead, the penalty that was rightfully owed to a bunch of rebel sinners. I've never been tempted by the knowledge that at any moment, with but a word, I could call down legions of angels to turn the tables and nail my executioners to their rightful crosses instead. I've never been tempted that way. Ours is not the God of Buddhism's denial. Suffering is just an illusion. You've got to rise above it. He's not the silent, non-existent God of atheism's despair. He's not the God of Islam who can't even be bothered with such trivial, messy, worldly, human problems. Our God understands because our God was willing to suffer the very worst of it for us so that we could inherit all the riches of heaven in him. Our God is real and he knows our suffering is real because he understands it. Step number two in lament is we appeal to God. We cry out to God and then we appeal to God. We call upon Him. We petition Him. We implore Him. We plead with Him if need be. That's what David does here in verses 3 and 4. He employs three imperative verbs to beg God. He says, consider me. Answer me. Light up my eyes. What do you do when you feel like God has forgotten you? Like verse 1, like God is hiding his face from you. You appeal to God and you say, consider me, look at me, notice me and my suffering. What do you do when you feel like God is ignoring you and you've resigned yourself, verse 2, to taking counsel in your own soul instead because you feel like you can't even get an audience with God anymore? You appeal to God and you say, answer me, acknowledge me, respond to me, God. Even if it's to say no, that would be better than silence. Say something. And what do you do when in David's case, you literally fear for your life? When you know that if God does not intervene, verse 3, there is an imminent threat that you may be sleeping the sleep of death soon. Or even in most of our cases, if it's a metaphorical death, a loss, an overwhelming grief, What do you do? You appeal to God and say, light up my eyes. Give me life, God. I need you to, Psalm 23, restore my soul. Lest, verse 4, my enemies say I've prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. How do we interpret All these psalms talking about enemies. If we're honest, we don't really have enemies anymore, do we? I mean, there are people we don't like. There are people who don't like us. But we're not really cool enough to have enemies anymore. You've got to be a movie superhero to have an enemy these days, an arch nemesis. But the Bible makes it clear that we actually do have an enemy. The adversary, deceiver, the wicked one, the ruler of darkness, and the prince of this world, Satan. And he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, seeking to devour you. He is the ultimate enemy, and he is also real. And like God, he also understands suffering. But unlike God, he wants to use it to lead you astray, to shatter your faith, 
to stamp out your hope in God. But we also know biblically that Satan operates always under God's purview, that God holds Satan's leash, that every little bit of havoc that Satan wants to wreak in this world, God chooses to allow, not because he is scorning us, but because he is refining us, Isaiah 48.10. Because God disciplines those he loves, Hebrews 12.6. And yet, that is not fun. And so Jesus teaches us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the Greek in Matthew 6, 13 is actually reads, deliver us from the evil one, from Satan, deliver us. And as we pray that, as we appeal to God, consider me, answer me, light up my eyes, we can have hope brothers and sisters, because we know two things. Number one, God is listening, and number two, God is caring. God listens, and he cares. Let me just give you one scripture to pair with each of those truths. It's so hard because there's so many beautiful promises all throughout scripture that remind us of those foundational uh, truths, but God listens and God cares, but here is just one apiece. Jot them down, take them with you, meditate on them, revel in them. Number one, God listens to your cries. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence that we have toward Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He will hear us. And if we know that He hears us, And whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Did you hear that? That's a promise of God. Anything we ask, according to his will, in accordance with his will, he hears us and he acts. And number two, God cares about your suffering. 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Cast all your anxieties on him, because why? He cares for you. He cares for you. He cares for you. He cares for you. Finally, friends, step number three of lament is we trust God. We have hope because we can trust God. We can trust God, again, for two reasons. These are probably the best of all because number one, God is sovereign and number two, God is good. He's sovereign and he's good. Vrogop explains Christians lament because we know that God is both sovereign and good. Christians know his promises in the scripture and we believe in God's power to deliver. We know Promises like Romans 8, 28, that God has promised to work all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If God wasn't sovereign, we could not trust that he had the power to do that, to bring light out of darkness, to bring good out of evil. If God wasn't good, we couldn't trust that he'd even have the desire to do it. But our hope is in the unchanging character of who God is, that he is 100% able and 100% willing to bless his beloved children at all times. And what that means is, if you're going through a really difficult struggle right now, God has paradoxically ordained it for your good and for your growth and for his own ultimate glory. Friends, I know that that is a hard truth to accept sometimes. We do not always see how God is using it in the moment, why God is ordaining it. I don't claim to have those answers for why God allows infants to die. God knows that faith-wise, I am chief among sinners. I do not stand before you this morning as a pillar of faith, as a beacon of unwavering hope and confidence in God's promises. That's not me. But here's what I do know. I know that when times get tough, 
I need that hope that I can put my trust in God's steadfast love. I know that when life kicks me in the teeth, I need that hope that my heart will rejoice again to see God's salvation, that he will come through. That in the darkest of nights, I have that hope that I can still sing to the Lord because I can look back and I can reflect and I can realize that he has dealt bountifully with me before in the past, that he hasn't failed me yet, and so why would I be afraid that he is going to start now? Did you catch David's intentional alternation back and forth between the past and future tenses of the verbs in verses 5 and 6? We're almost done, but, but please don't miss this. David says, I have trusted in your love, past tense, so I shall rejoice in your future salvation. I will sing to the Lord, future tense, because he has dealt bountifully with me, past tense. And here's the takeaway principle for us this morning. Our future hope is rooted in God's past faithfulness. Our future hope is rooted in God's past faithfulness. And so I ask you this morning, friends, what past faithfulness of God in your life can you look back on? Can you hang your hat on? Can you rest your hope in that when times get tough again, that you know if he has proven himself to be sovereign and good and faithful before, that he will do it again. Recognize this morning that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have trusted in Jesus for your salvation, then you've already got your answer. The most dire suffering that you were facing and totally powerless over, death and hell defeated. The most desperate need in your life, forgiveness of your sin, the redemption of your soul, satisfied. And for those of you who haven't yet trusted in him this morning, who haven't yet put all of your hope in Christ and Christ alone for this life and in the life to come, if you haven't trusted in Jesus' steadfast love, the kind of love that would die for you, the kind of rescuing love that causes hearts to rejoice in his salvation. Did you know that the Hebrew word in verse 5 for salvation is Yeshua? That's Jesus' name in Aramaic. David literally exclaims in Psalm 13, verse 5, a thousand years before Jesus is born, my heart shall rejoice in Jesus. Yeshua. Does your heart rejoice in him, friend? It can today. Trust in Jesus, and even in the midst of your suffering, watch him, watch him turn your despair, turn your denial into a confident dare to hope again in the promises of God.